Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's give all of our youth a great big round of applause as they make their way out. Appreciate them. Hallelujah. A bunch of uh, our kid kids are going to camp uh, this Monday. And so uh, let's believe God that they'll uh, stay cool because it's likely to get a little warmish uh, where they're heading. And uh, where I, what I mean by that is up in Dayton, you know, Iowa, hot, summer, July, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, but I'm sure they'll have a terrific time. We want to welcome all of you this morning. Delighted you can be with us here today. Praise God. You know, I always say it and everybody responds. This is the day that the Lord has made. So what are we going to do? Rejoice. What else are we going to do? Yeah. Amen. Praise God. You know, there's a couple different ways you can live life. You can do it his way. Or you can do it your own way, I guess, or whatever. But thank God, you know, His way is better. Amen? Amen? And so again, we're just delighted you can be with us. Praise God. We're going to get into the Word of God today and uh, carry on uh, in a subject that we've been talking about, about walking in love. And uh, how many of you know uh, the love way is the best way? Yes. Now, you know, there may be some challenges in actually carrying that out, but thank God we can do it because the greater one is within us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody say it together. I can, I can. Do, all do all things through Christ, through Christ. who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. So whenever you get that thought, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, you can always answer with that verse of Scripture out of the book of Philippians, and you'll probably get blessed as a result of it. Amen. Let's open our Bibles together to Ephesians chapter 4. If you can find that, actually, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Praise God. Just want to get into what I want to share with you here this morning right away. and Because you know me, I can be a little long-winded. And uh, I, you know, I guess, I don't know if it's okay or not. I just do it, you know, hallelujah, amen. If you don't have anything to say, then maybe you ought to be quiet. But I'm, I'm hoping that I've got something to say. So anyway, it'll be good, right? All right, Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Now, let me ask an important question here before we get started. How many of you came here today because you expect something from heaven? Wow. Look at we got the whole Peterson crew back up here. Let's, let's give Diane and, and her daughter, yeah, her and Kayla a big old round of applause. Traveled 500 miles to come to church. How about that? Amen. So anyway, you know, sometimes I get distracted. That's part of the reason why I go so long. Who? Oh, yes, let's not forget about the clons. The clons are here, you know, uh, John and Lori and, and a bunch of kids and Heidi and another John and David. And, wow, the whole crew. Yeah, we need to give it up. Hi, Amy. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Who else we got here? I, I, met, a, I, I met some folks here that just moved from Omaha to uh, Avoca, right? Yeah, and this is their first time. They come walking in. They look like a calf looking at a new gate. And I, I decided right away they don't have a clue what they're doing. And I was right. So I provided them some direction, and here we are. So, uh, again, I'm glad you're all here. Praise God. You know, in the summertime, people are coming and going and vacating and doing all kinds of things. And so it's uh, good that you can be a part of what it is that's going on here. Glory to God. All right. Let's pray together. And I'll try not to get distracted. <laughs> Father, we love you so much. It is our privilege to be able to come before you, Father God, to lift our voices in praise and adoration to you. God, we owe our lives to you in every way, shape, and form. So for these few moments we have together, Father God, I thank you for helping us to have a hearing, listening ear, and eyes to see, and hearts that believe the Word of God. And we're just so grateful, Father, for this privilege we have because, Father, we are of all people most blessed. And we thank you, Father God, for those that have made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life, that their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and they have the assurance of heaven being their home. And God, we'd pray that if there's any person here or even online that has yet to make the decision to become a follower of Jesus, that, Father, today would be that day for them, that they would not allow one more moment, Father, to escape them in their lives without making Jesus the Lord of their life. 
And we just thank you for your blessing, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Notice with me, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, Be ye therefore, King James says, followers of God as dear children, or imitators, we could say. Again, be ye therefore imitators or followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. One of the things that you'll discover in terms of the characteristics of love is that it finds its expression in giving. Love gives. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Aren't you glad this morning? that he was willing to give his son as a ransom for us so that we could be here today, and more importantly, just to know him, to have access, to have the assurance of eternal life, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, to live out a life that is acceptable and pleasing unto him. God has made all this possible because he gave. Well, that characteristic of giving is something that should also be, you know, apparent within all of our lives as believers. Amen. Okay, Uh, six of you thought it was a good idea. How about the rest of you? To be able to give your life as, you know, and and honor the Lord in your giving. I remember years ago, my wife and I, when we first got married, I was at Bible school, and uh, her sister Jan was getting married, and she had a very, very close and good friend in high school that ended up in a car accident, became a quadriplegic. And... um, As part of the arrangement, in order for uh, uh, her to be able to attend uh, Jan's wedding, we were on our way from Tulsa, and uh, she was in Lawrence, I believe, at the time, and uh, we were going to stop by and pick her up. And, of course, the logistics of all of that was quite involved, and her grandmother was traveling with in order to care for her. And they had a van. Uh, it It was a decent van. It wasn't anything special. But it, it, it helped to, uh, for transportation's sake. And so when John and I left Tulsa to come up, we, just, we made a determination that we were going to do everything we could to be a blessing to this uh, gal and to her grandmother. And we didn't have much, you know, in the way of substance or anything of that nature, but we just decided that we'd just do everything we could to pour our lives into uh, them for this weekend that we had together. And... Um, it was, it was really our, uh, as it turned out, it was really our privilege to be able to do that because, you know, when people have these circumstances, uh, there's a lot of difficulty and duress and challenge and everything that you can name and just all of the things. Well, when we got here, uh, the, the van, the front, uh, one of the brakes was, the brakes on the front of it were shot. You know, they just, uh, you know, it was metal to metal, and that was a problem. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Well, now it's Saturday, and uh, so what are we going to do about this? And to make a long story short, we ended up just uh, doing a little maintenance and service on this van. We pulled the hubs off and put new brakes on it and got, I don't know if we got them reground or something, but anyway, we made it all happen and put these brakes back together, and uh, actually it was her dad that flipped the bill, but it didn't, you know, they wanted to pay for it. We said, oh, no, not at all. We, we got this, you know, not we, he, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so any time and every time that we had an opportunity, uh, we did everything we could to serve them. And that's the other thing about love is, is that, again, it finds expression both in giving and in serving. Are you listening to me? You know, And now as a little side note here, as I'm thinking about this, you know, the thing about it is you never know what kind of a blessing you could be to someone else if you just will make an effort to go out of your way to be a blessing to them. Are you listening to me? I've got some, I've got a neighbor that just lost his wife and um, um, they'd been married for uh, quite a number of years. She was in her eighties and different things like that. But you know, when you lose uh, your, your, your wife, it's, it's a, there's a real absence there. Well, one of the folks in our church is a neighbor to them, uh, along with myself, and, you know, they just went down and they had a book, you know, by Tony Cook on life after death, I think is the name of it, and, and gave that to him and things and spent some time with him and, uh, you know, went their way. 
Now, you wouldn't think that that's a big deal necessarily. Next day, I went to see and check on him, you know, just to see how he was doing. That's the first thing he brought up. Hey, I had company last night. And I said, oh, really good. How about, you know, uh, what was that all about? Well, they're from your church. And I said, really? And so we went on to talk, and he talked about this book being given to him and to him. And, and you know, he made it clear that it was really... Um, uplifting. It was, um, it helped, you know, and, and, you know, if you want to live to yourself, I guess you can, but I, I'm grateful for this couple within our church that decided, you know, we're going to, we're going to carve out a piece of our lives and we're going to go down here and be a blessing to someone who's experienced loss. Are you listening to me? And there's, and there's people like this, you guys, everywhere. And so you can be a huge blessing to the people that are around you if you just look for the opportunity. Well, anyway, we had the wedding and everything was wonderful. And well, she's been putting up with Phil for all of these years. Let's see. How's it? It's going to be like 44 years coming up, isn't it? 45. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 45. 45 long years, right, Jan? Okay, well, anyway. Um, so we had to take them home, and uh, on one occasion, I don't remember what it is that we had done, but now this was unsolicited, but, but this grandmother made this statement to us. She said, you people are so full of love. And so um, I tell you what, you can make an impact on, on people if you want to. So we took them home, and uh, we got, uh, uh, got them situated and got them back to their place, and you know, it was kind of back to the usual thing, and, and life was going to go on. Well, we left there, and we were on the way, you know, back home. I don't think we got maybe two blocks. I've only had this happen to me on two occasions. One time I was in a hospital with a guy that was dying from cancer, and then this particular situation. And when I say it, I'm saying it in the context that when I see people in these situations, I realize so deeply how much it is not the will of God. You know, when you talk about sickness, when you talk about disease, you talk about infirmity, you talk about anything that causes dis-ease and ill health, it does not come from heaven in any way, shape, or form. Well, as we left, you know, I just be, I broke and began to cry about this, you know, because my heart just went out to the circumstance that these people were in. And I just, you know, Joan and I were there together, and we just prayed right then. And I said, God, help us to be a blessing to humanity, to help people like this, you know, and make a difference in their lives. Don't you think that's a better way to live? I said, don't you think that's a better way to live? Now, you can live into yourself, and the world's doing it in a big way. You know, the world is filled with absolute selfishness. And uh, self, 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 self. Self, 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 self. And, uh, but thank God we don't have to live that way. Can you say amen? amen. So in our uh, text here, it says that you and I are to walk in love. I mentioned to you on one occasion, you know, that walking in love means to pursue a course of action or a way of life. It's about your conduct. It's about the way you behave. It means to be or to act in association with, well, in this case the characteristics of love. Walk in love. And it's interesting, if you look in the, in the scriptures here, you know, when the Apostle Paul uh, is talking, he, he uses this figure of speech in a number of different places throughout this letter that he wrote to them. For example, in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, As a prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you that you walk worthy. Walk worthy worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. And in verse 17, he says, as you therefore, uh, as I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. So he used this, again, figure of speech frequently to describe, you know, our conduct, our behavior, or our manner of life. 
So when it comes to family, when it comes to the family of God, the church, when it comes to the world, when it comes to our relationship with God, how many of you know we're supposed to walk in love? You know, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that love would do? Now turn with me to John's Gospel, and let's look at John chapter 13 here. John, the 13th chapter, and notice something here that Jesus had to say about the subject. In chapter 13, verse 34, he said, a new commandment. Everybody say new commandment. commandment. Well, a new commandment means it's a different one from the old one, right? And so he's making a distinction between the Old Testament and the law versus the New Testament or the new covenant that he's making, or has made actually, because and through the blood of Jesus. So he says, I give you a new covenant, or a new commandment, and uh, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he went on to say, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now notice he didn't give us a suggestion. Huh? He didn't say, hey, I've got something I'd just kind of like to suggest to you. No, he says, I give you a new commandment. So I would have to say, if, if someone commands you, you don't really have an option. Isn't that right? Although we really do, because, you know, you can disobey the command if you want, but thank God we don't have to. And he said, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Now, you know, in the old Adamic nature you know, the sinful nature of man, it is impossible to love as God loves. Are you with me? People in the world that don't know Jesus, they can't love with the God kind of love because the God kind of love is not in them to do it. So it's an impossibility on their part, but thank God it's not impossible for you and me. And so we have the privilege to be able to represent the kingdom. He said this, he said, by this shall all men know You are my disciples. In other words, you know, a person that is a child of God who's committed to walking in love is going to stand out from the world because we're not going to be acting like and behaving like the world. Now, again, you can if you want to. The Bible says in the, you know, last days that the love of many will grow cold, but thank God that our love doesn't have to. You know, here's a, here's a scripture, and I hadn't even, it really wasn't part of my deal, but turn over to the book of Jude with me real quickly and take a look at this verse. Jude, it's just got one chapter in it. Notice this with me. Um, <clears throat> in Jude chapter 1, <laughs> verse 20, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost... Now, uh, this is a little side thought. It really isn't our subject. But a lot of people, you know, people say, well, pray that I'll have more faith. Well, you can't pray for more more faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You can pray all you want, but the reality is if you want more faith, you got to get the Word on the inside of you. In other words, get in the book and let the book get in you. So in that scripture there where it says, you, beloved, building up or edifying yourself upon the faith that you have, praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You'll get blessed by praying in the Spirit. Amen? Now notice in the King James, the next verse, 21, says, keeping yourself in the love of God. Now some of your Bible translations may say, keep yourselves in. Now I don't know whether it's meant to imply that when you pray in the Spirit, it'll help to keep you, you know, in the love of God. I like to think that it would, amen, because at least you're letting your heart and your spirit dominate you instead of your flesh. Hallelujah. You know, but it says, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Here's a question for you. Who is it that keeps you in the love of God? You do. You keep yourselves in the love of God, right? People say a lot of times, well, I just can't do that. Well, that's not really true. Matter of fact, it's not true at all. You just don't want to. You know, you just got a little streak of orneriness there that you want to pet, you know, you know and, and participate in. But that's not what the Bible says. He said, I gave you a new commandment that you love as I've loved you. And I also gave you the means and the wherewith all and the empowerment to be able to do that. 
So you just got to take your flesh and tell it to shut up. Can I get a witness? Huh? Because you know as well as I do, you know your flesh can get in the road. Now, I don't like to tell off on this, but I'll tell it anyway for the sake of learning. But there was a time, you know, when I had to talk with a gal and she, she got me riled up. Any of you ever been riled up? And I said some things that I probably, it wasn't necessarily what I said, but the way I said it. And it was very unchristlike. And But I let her know what I thought. Now, I know none of you, God bless you, you got them halos on there, I can see them, and you never do any of this kind of thing, so, you know, uh, you know do what you want, <laughs> you know, crucify me, I don't care. But anyway, it happened. So anyway, I go home, and I am so smitten on the inside. I mean the Holy Ghost on the inside, my spirit. I mean, I, we, we were sitting down, at, you know, having a bite to eat, and I tell you, I couldn't hardly eat. I, if I mentioned it once, I probably told her six times about the whole deal. I said, finally, I said, I got to go. She goes, go. Yeah, I got to go back and apologize to that woman, you know. And so that's what I did. And isn't that a lot better than just saying, well, you know, I ain't going to mess with this. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It does matter, you know. Now, I wasn't wrong. I don't, want, I don't mean to try to defend myself. I mean, the problem that we had... I was not wrong in that. It's the way I handled it. How many of you have ever done that before? You know? And so I screwed up. All right? So any of you that never have, uh, I'll, we'll go outside and get your pile of rocks and go for it. But I'm just saying that it's always better to obey the Spirit of God and listen to the Holy Ghost. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. And so anyway, it's important. The capacity to love as Jesus love is due to your being born of the Spirit of God. That's what enables us. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. I wish Christians would start living after the new creation instead of allowing the old man, are you listening to me, to be the dominant figure within their lives. You know, I mean, here's the thing, you guys, you, you can get born again and born of the Spirit of God, but God wants you to grow. As a matter of fact, He requires you to. But a lot of times Christians don't. They don't place a priority on their relationship with God and the Word of God and following the Holy Ghost and listening to the Spirit of God and, and allowing the washing of the water of the Word of God to conform them into the image of Christ. So they stay carnal. And they live carnal, and they talk carnal, and they act carnal. Now, they're saved. You know, you say, well, are they going to heaven? I'm, that's way above my pay scale. I'll let God and them take care of all that. Are you listening to me? And you'll find that even with people that are filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, they speak with other tongues, and yet, right on the other hand, they don't do much of it. They've been filled. They've had an experience where God filled them with the Holy Ghost. You know, but yet right on the other hand, they, again, they let their flesh dominate them. And so consequently, you know, there's all kinds of behaviors and things, and you could almost say, well, I thought you were a Christian, or I thought you were filled with the Holy Ghost. I thought, you know, whatever. In other words, what I'm saying to you folks is God expects more of us as the children of God. Can you say amen? And he wants us to rise up to a different level in, in terms of the way that we live. And everybody say this, I can do that. Amen. You sure enough can, so can I, hallelujah. And we can grow in the love of God, and that's what he wants to uh, happen in each and every one of our lives. So, it's important for us to understand, you know, when you get saved, your body doesn't change, your mind doesn't change, but the real you, that inner man, gets transformed. Your nature is changed. How many of you can attest to that? I mean, before you were saved, I mean, you were one ornery outfit, and then Jesus came into your life, and all of a sudden, the hate, the anger, you know, all of the lying and everything else just seemed to evaporate and disappear. That's because of the new birth. That's because of being born of the Spirit of God. But now listen, if you don't allow that to dominate you, and if you don't learn to follow the Spirit of God, you can let that old man back in. I said, you can let the old man back in. And then pretty soon, you know, you're living a certain kind of way, or however you want to put it, and you don't think anything of it. It's just kind of that quote-unquote natural kind of thing. 
But sometimes we ought to check up on ourselves a little bit, amen? And just ask ourselves, how is it that I'm living? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5 in your Bible there, if you would please. Galatians, the fifth chapter. Notice what it says here. You know, it's amazing how much the Bible has to say about walking in love. That was a joke. I said, there's a lot of stuff in there about walking in love and how it is that we're to love. Notice here in, in Paul's letter to the uh, churches there in Galatia, in verse 13 of the fifth chapter, he says this. He says, for brethren, we've been called to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but again, by love, serve one another. Let's stop right there for a moment. Let's get the context of what's being talked about here. What had happened with the churches there is, is that they'd come into the knowledge of the truth, been born of the Spirit of God, got turned on to the Word, they're excited, and all of a sudden a bunch of religious people came in and started trying to put them back underneath the law and keeping the Ten Commandments. Now realize, if you walk in love, love is the fulfillment of all laws. Are you with me? You know, if you love somebody, you're not going to, you know, hate them. If you love somebody, you're not going to, you know, tell on them bad or anything of that nature. So love is the fulfilling of the Ten Commandments. But these religious people in their doctrine wanted to place them back underneath this bondage, really, you know, and keep them within their grips to control. That's what the devil loves to do. And so... <clears throat> Paul, you know, is addressing this theology and he's saying it's a bunch of junk. He says, you know, circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't mean anything. But, you know, faith that works by love. So in that context here, then in verse 13, he says that we're to by love serve one another for all the law, verse 14, is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But, if you bite and devour one another, you know, small wars have been fought over doctrinal issues in churches, split churches, messed up people, made them offended. They go off in the weeds someplace. They're no longer a part of the body life of the church. And they just got jacked. This stuff comes from hell. Are you listening to me? You know, and it's intended for one person or one purpose. And that is to divide and conquer. And that's what we see so often, you know, in people's life. Well, I don't believe that, blah, 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 blah. You know, some stuff, you know, we fight and, you know, it's like it's the end of the world if we don't win. No, it's not. Are you with me? Well, I just believe, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and the thing about it is, is that um, it doesn't really sometimes even amount to a hill of beans. Now, this was an issue that Paul was addressing in this particular setting. Notice again in 15, he says, But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, what's that next word? What is it? Oh, there it is again. Walk what? Walk in the Spirit. He said, walk in love. Huh? Don't walk after the world and the Gentiles, but walk in love. Walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the desires or the dictates, I guess you could say, uh, uh, the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh, in verse 17, lusts against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. How many of you have ever felt like knocking somebody in the head? You have? Oh, all right, great. She's honest. Hallelujah. Now we all have, you know. And that is the conflict that takes place within our lives. What are you going to do in those circumstances? Are you with me? Again, years ago, I've had this happen to me a couple times. You know, I was in the office and this gal came in and she was upset. And she just reamed me out. Up one side, down the other. Should have been there. Probably could have made a movie out of it or something. And I just sat there and listened to her. I mean, I, you know, I was kind of surprised to begin with, you know, and just rah, 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 just all over the place. Well, the problem wasn't with me. The problem was her and her life and everything it was, you know, messed up. And so, you know, and she didn't even let me get a word in as wise, you know. I just finally, you know, she just left, went storming out of the, you know, the office there. Uh, you remember that, Deanna, were you? You're probably there. I don't know if you were there or not. 
So many things have happened, you know, you can't decide which one I'm talking about. I know, yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> I've actually had that happen a couple t- times, you know. And the best thing to do is say nothing. Because a lot of times when folks, you know, attack you like that, they want to fight. But if you don't say anything, this, this could probably apply in your marriage. You know, you might think about this. Just, just a thought. But anyway, if you don't say anything, at least, you know, you, it can't go anywhere. Now, they'll probably get madder because you don't say anything, but just stay the course. Are you listening to me? And that's what I did, you know. Why? Because, praise God, I am not going to stoop to the level of the devil and listen to a bunch of nonsense that don't amount to a hill of beans. And in this particular case, her problem was she wasn't being recognized in the church the way that she thought she should and so on and so forth. You know, I'm not the one that does the promoting. He does. You know, the Bible says to prove yourself faithful and he'll take care of the rest of it. Are you listening to me? Well, anyway, there's a lot of things I could talk about along that line. But anyway, if you want to experience the blessing of God, how many of you want to do that here? If you want to experience the blessing of God, then you have to let the love of God dominate you instead of your flesh. That's all there is to it. Now, it goes on here in these verses to describe uh, the, the works of the flesh. But notice verse 22, for the sake of time, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Everybody say, I got that. Yeah, you got that. The fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, actually, and then meekness and temperance or self-control, 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 self, self-control. Keep yourself in the love of God. Huh? Everybody say, I can do that too. <laughs> a little mumble in that a little bit. I want to do that. Yeah. Temperance, self-control, against such there is no law. And then it goes on then to say, and they that are Christ, how many of you are Christ's? The, all of you? Some of you? Part of you? Come on, get your hand up. You guys are going to sleep on me. I got to get some movement, get some blood flowing here, you know? They that are Christ have what? Crucified, huh? The flesh with its affections and lusts or desires. If we live in the Spirit, if we're born of the Spirit of God, then let us also walk in the Spirit of God. Let's not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another and envying one another. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for this today? You say, what do do I do, though, about these people that are just, you know, in my life and they're just, you know, they're messing everything up? Pray for them. Boy, they need your prayers. You say, I don't want to pray for them. I know. I know. I know. No, that's the last thing you feel like doing. But thank God you don't have to be dominated by the way you feel. As an act of your will, praise God, you can just obey God. And you can tell God, say, God, I don't feel like it, and you know that. But I'm telling you right now, I just want to lift this person up to you in the name of Jesus. I ask you to bless them and help them. Hallelujah. So you have to, you, you have to crucify your flesh. You don't say the things that you'd like to say. Boy, it sure gets quiet when you start talking about these things. You know, (laughs) don't say everything you think to say. Huh? I'm thinking about Captain Winchell back here, you know, and the law enforcement and the situations that these guys get themselves into. I mean, he's probably hurt it all. You know, when they're get into these domestic situations and everything like that. And so, you know, here's a perfect example. Somebody's just, you know, you just kind of let it play out. Let them do their, all their talking and stuff, you know, and whatever. And you don't, you know, uh, escalate the situation. But you actually do things and say things and deal with it and handle it in a way. You know, the Bible says that, praise God, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Are you listening to me? Wouldn't that serve us a lot better if we do that? Amen. Of course it would. Hallelujah. So you don't say everything you think to say. You don't do everything you think to do. Hallelujah. We practice restraint. 
you know. We don't throw things. Now you laugh, but I tell you what, I'm talking believers, man. They get into it and all of a sudden they pick something up and all of a sudden there's stuff in the air flying. You say, really? Yeah, yeah, sure enough. A lot of good that's going to do. Hope the other person's fast on their feet. As believers, <laughs> as a believer, you're going to have situations that, and circumstances that rub you the wrong way, and you're going to have to decide how you're going to respond. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Like I said, sometimes you, you do and say nothing. Just keep her quiet, baby, on the down low. Wait till they run out of gas. Huh? You know, at some point they're going to run out of gas. You know, then you can say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way about, you, about it, you know. But I tell you what, God's got a better way. Sometimes you need to be led by the Spirit of God. You know, the thing about it is, is when you hear all of this stuff going on out here, listen down here. And he'll, he'll lead you and he'll guide you. You know, I used that scripture last week about the fact, he said, don't be concerned about what it is when you get into a situation where you're, you're being um, pressed upon. Don't worry about what you say. The Holy Ghost in you will give you what it is that you need. And he does. Are you listening to me? Praise God so that you can diffuse the situation. Sometimes you have to ask yourself in situations like that, well, what would love do? You know, and then put that into practice. Hallelujah. So now I'll ask you this question this morning, and you'll probably have numerous answers to the question. But, but you know, when I talk to you about walking in love and what the Bible has to say and that it's the winner's way, it's God's way, it's your way, hallelujah, you know, you've got to ask yourself the question, you know, what is it that's going to drive that discipline in my life? You know? I mean, again, I said, and I think you all agree that what I'm telling you is true, but what is it that will actually drive the discipline in your life to do these things? Because it's an important question. You know, the real, reality is, I mean, you might say, well, you know, I'm going to do it because it'll benefit me. And that would be accurate, wouldn't it? Huh? You might say, I'm going to do it because I want my prayers answered. Because if you don't walk in love, you can't get your prayers answered. But I'd like to suggest to you that maybe the, the bedrock reason for us to do this is because he asked us to, because he first loved us. Are you listening to me? So when somebody's ranting and raving, you can just go back to the situation and say, Father, I'm so glad that you saved me and gave me a life like no other. And I am willing to represent you as you would have me to in this situation. Are you with me? Because I tell you what, that's the winner's way. How many of you want to win here today? Amen? So it's important that we do it. Again, he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, so shall you be my disciples if you love or have loved one for another. Hallelujah. Now let's look at one more scripture here. Let's turn over to 1 uh, John chapter 4, the first epistle of John. There towards the end before you get to the book of Revelation. How many of you are glad you came today? Amen? Talking about walking in love and the importance of doing that. Notice with me, if you will, here in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Beloved, how many beloveds we got here today? Okay, so this is talking to you. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, because God is love. And in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation or an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Now, notice this last verse, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, then we ought to love one another. Amen? So you have to ask yourself again, you know, in cir certain circumstances and things, you know, what is it that love would do? You know, and sometimes people, and I mentioned this last week, they, they equate, you know, walking in love with being weak. And I'm telling you what, walking in love is anything but weak. 
It's a strength. Are you with me? I mean, when you choose to take the high road and do what love would have you to do in a situation, you know, a lot of people say, well, I wouldn't put up with that if I were you, you know? And then they, they get all, they get their nose out of joint and their britches all bunched up and, you know, knotted up and they don't know whether they're coming or going. That's no way to live. Did you hear me? It's no way. I want to give you some practical guidance because after the service on Sunday, there was a number of different individuals, you know, that came up to me and, and talked a little bit um, about their circumstances and how it is that they should, you know, relate to or deal with um, that particular deal. So turn to Romans chapter 12, and let's, let's preface my comments with uh, something Paul said here uh, with regard to this. Because uh, all of us have either immediate or even extended family members that aren't saved, but they are our family. Huh? And so we are commanded to love them, even though sometimes they can be very unlovely. Are you listening to me? And so how do you navigate through that? That's, that's a legitimate question, you know. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with unlovely people? Now, if you've grown up in a family that's been civil and, you know, grown up, you know, with uh, certain practices of honor and respect and things of that nature, these aren't things that, that you deal with. But the reality is, is that not everyone has had that circumstance. And sometimes we marry into situations, you know, that are, how many of you know what I'm talking about? And so there's all kinds of caveats to this whole circumstance. But that doesn't change what it is that Jesus asked you to do. Are you with me? So from a practical standpoint in providing guidance, the Apostle Paul, notice what he says here. This is uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse uh, 17. It says, first of all, you're not to reward or recompense, recompense any man evil for evil. It says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, it would seem to suggest maybe that in certain circumstances, you can't live peaceably with them. Huh? Would you agree? So it says here, in this verse at least, as much as lies, if it be possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably uh, with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it's written, vengeance is mine, And I will uh, repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy be hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And notice this, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's good advice, isn't it? I said, that's good advice. I said, that's good advice. I told you about the pastor's wife that said she hated her mother-in-law last week, you know, and the, the advice that the minister give to her is act like you do love her, because you really do. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart, but we allow our emotions and we allow our flesh to begin to dominate us. And we think about it. We meditate about it. We, I mean, we do. And we even talk about it, you know, and all of a sudden we built this incredible stronghold and this mountain in our life. But instead of doing that, what we should do is we should say, you know what, I'm going to rethink this a little bit, and I'm going to start doing what the Bible says, and I'm going to start loving them. Well, in this situation, she invited them over for dinner, you know? Now, here's a person that says, I hate my mother-in-law. At least that's what she said. But you know what? She acted in accordance with the Word of God, invited them over, had a good conversation. Lots of things came out of it, you know, and she realized that she really did love her mother-in-law, you know. And, and the thing of it is, is that all of us in our families, we have personalities and different things and people, you know. And that's why the Bible says that we're to forbear one another in love. What does that mean? That means put up with them. Huh? Pray for them. Say, oh God, please hurry and help this person grow. You know what I'm saying? But yet, right on the other hand, what we don't want to do is put our tongue on them and, you know, talk about how ugly they are and how they don't this. You're not helping them. Huh? You're not helping them. If you want to help them, pray for them. I believe God. 
you know? So there's a practical application here in, in, in this, you know, um, that we can learn. As much as lies within you, live peaceably with all people. Now, sometimes you can't, all right? And I mentioned to you earlier, you know, I'm not going to let the world around me and people use me for a rug. But on the other hand, you know, I'm going to do what I can to walk in love toward them. Amen? Are you with me? I mean, if a person takes advantage of you, you know, sometimes you just have to let it go and move on, but don't put yourself in a position where it can happen again. And I see this in families. I counsel people all the time. You know, they got family members that are, you know, taking advantage of them and, and, uh, and, and the person, you know, that's dealing with the circumstance, a lot of times they're enabling these people to continue doing their dirt. Am I in the right house? And the reality is, is sometimes you got to say, listen, there ain't anybody that loves you more than I do, but I ain't doing this no more. You know, and you say, well, that's not very Christ-like. Well, is it or isn't it? Am I doing them a favor by continuing to perpetuate bad behavior by enabling them and doing all this? Are you with me? Long time ago, had a situation where there was a couple and... and um, and they had a, a child, a son, and he was taking advantage of them, no doubt about it. And, you know, and then what he would do is he'd put them, put them in this guilt trip. You know, when they got tired of, you know, funding all of this kind of business, you know, and then they didn't want to. They said, well, now this is it. And then he'd come back, here he comes, and then he would rail on them because they weren't, you know, uh, providing or didn't love him or whatever, you know, the excuse was. And I said, you got to see that for what it is. And you got to recognize, you know, in this situation, you know, that I, you just tell them, son, we've done everything we know to do for you. And we've done this and that and other to try to help you. And this is the way you repay us and reward us. So I'm just telling you, we're done. And that's what I told them to do. Cut them off. Now people will say, well, that's pretty unloving. Well, again, let, let's, let's think about the context of this. Are you listening to me? I hope you don't take what I'm saying out of, out of its context, because I'm sure somebody will try. But the reality is, praise God, you're doing them no favor. As a matter of fact, the best thing you can do is just say, look, you're old enough now. Go make a living for yourself. Go make something out of you. And you know, there's entitlement, you know, attitudes, you know, that people have, you know. God, nobody owes you a living, are you with me? But yet, in the world in which we are now currently living, that is the sentiment. That somebody else ought to be doing everything and taking care of me and this and that and the other. That's not the way it works. I mean, that horse will only ride about so long and then there are going to be problems. Are you with me? So I don't believe in... I mean, and a lot of this has, has to do with your heart, your attitude... In, in how you approach the person. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, the Bible says this. Well, as a matter of fact, let's just look at it real quick. Turn over to, uh, did I get done reading this? Yeah. Turn over to 2 Timothy. Um, wow, this is really taking a different course. 2 Timothy chapter, uh, I think it's 3. Second Timothy chapter um, uh, two, two. Paul is writing here to young Timothy, giving him some instruction. Notice verse twenty-two. He said, "Flee also, flee also youthful lusts, and follow after righteousness, faith, and love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart." Now listen to this. But foolish and unlearned questions. What's it tell you? Tell you to do? Avoid. Avoid. You know, when that family member comes in your house or whatever, or you go there or whatever, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they come at you with some kind of question or whatever, uh, see it for what it is. If it's a trap, don't stick, don't stick your foot in it. Huh? Foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Notice it says, knowing that they will cause strife. And a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, able to teach and patient. Now, miss, listen. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God 
pre-adventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are being taken captive by him at his will. So what's that mean? They're being used to the devil to cause the problem. And the only way for them to get themselves delivered is to acknowledge the truth and repent. People, you know, they'll come at you, man, and they'll start, maybe they question your faith. Maybe they question, you know, your, your church involvement. Maybe they question, you know, uh, what it is that you believe. And, and, and in many ways, dude, they'll, they'll put it on you. And they'll try to attack you. Huh? Are you listening? In meekness, we're to instruct those that oppose themselves. You know, they're just, they don't know what they're talking about, dude. They're out in left field, and the devil is the one who's, you know, behind it to cause not only them, but you problems too. You, you, you understand where I'm coming from? I remember one time my wife and I, we had a wedding, or not a wedding, it was a funeral. It was a family uh, um, member, extended family member. And of course, you know, they weren't a part of our church, but I was pleased to be able to, you know, officiate as far as the, the funeral was concerned and so on and so forth. And, and it was here. I mean, I don't know if it was in this building. It probably was over in the other building. It's probably been over 20 some years ago. And so part of the plan was we were going to have this memorial service and things like that and, and whatnot. And then when we got done, um, we were, um, I don't know, it was a small funeral as I recall. Somehow or another, we ended up going to Oakland to have lunch together as a family. So it's an extended family. And, you know, uh, a lot of times y- y- you can't appreciate it, but sometimes, you know, you're wanting to do a good job for people, you know, and so you, you work hard to get ready and prepare and, you know, do that type of thing as far as the funeral is concerned. And when you're done with it, you're just pretty much glad it's over, you know? Linda, you ever feel that way when you get done with a song set? Not really. Just move right on, huh? Wow, she's powerful. Anyway, uh, so when I get done, you know, we're going to go have lunch. So we're just going to kind of relax and we're maybe going to catch up. We haven't seen each other for a long time and all of these different kinds of things. So had a long table, probably seated a dozen, maybe 15 of us or something of that nature, as I recall. And uh, <clears throat> we sit down and, and I watched this one cousin of mine and she made her way around and, and down and made sure she was sitting right in front of me. Now, I really didn't think anything about it. I mean, not until later. You know how that is? Jose, you know, not, not until later. Anyway, and, uh, uh, you know, we order and this and that and the other. And all of a sudden, dude, she takes off. And I can't remember. She's hugely liberal and very, had a real spirit about her that was less than Christ-like. And, and so she's, you know, getting all over my stuff about, I don't remember what it was. You remember what it was? No. And, uh, and so I'm just sitting there going, this, quite honestly, my thought was, you got to be kidding me. That's, that was my thought. I'm sitting there going, you know, I'm just smiling and nodding because she's just going off you know, about this, that, and the other. And, and I didn't say a word. You know, I finally said, well, obviously we disagree. Well, she don't want to hear that. She wants to make a big deal out of this. And I just said, you know, there are other people here as family members, you know, and we haven't seen one another for a long time. And I said, I'm not arguing with you about anything. I'm going to spend some time with the people who are a part of my family, and you can do what you want, but I'm done. You know, so don't, you know. I mean, you just, sometimes you just got to set people. And I wasn't trying to be mean. I did it, you know, in a... Um, I don't know how to describe it. You know, sometimes you got to be firm, you know. I mean, it's kind of like, what part of this don't you understand, dude? This, this conversation's over. Are you with me? Well, I never did see her again. Imagine that. Don't know where she's at. (laughs) Don't know nothing about her, but bless her heart, she wanted to fight. And there are people in the world that are like that. They want to contest uh, anything, you know. I mean, they'll just try to come up with something about, you know, what you embrace, you know, the things that you believe, 
the way that you live. Well, you don't have to do that. You know, you don't have to. Do that. No, it's not about having to do anything. It's what I want to do. You know, are you listening to me? And yet, uh, there'll always be those that contest you, and we're out of time. Hallelujah. So, this is, uh, I'm going to read this out of the uh, um, New Living Translation. It's, it's 2 Timothy 3, 1. Listen to it. See if it doesn't seem to apply with where we're at right now. Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. And they will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. You know, one of the funny things, I'll, I'll get back to this in a minute, one of the funny things that happens in our lives, not everybody always knows we're a preacher. So when we first meet them, you know, man, they're just being themselves. They got the F-bomb going. I mean, it's just like, you know, all kind of wild things happening. Here just recently, uh, one of our family members <laughs> was in this situation, and they were sitting there thinking, I just can't wait till I ask what I do. <laughs> because this, the gal that she was with and talking to is just, you know, showing no restraint. Well, so finally... Kind of came around to, what is it that you do? Well, you know, um, um, I'm a minister's wife. And so, <laughs> you'd think that that would cause some form of restraint. But the fact of the matter is, she didn't slow up one iota. She just kept right on. And, and you know, the thing about it is, I mean, in, in times past, you know, <laughs> Everybody, when they find out you're a preacher, they'll, you know, kind of straighten up, you know, and behave a little bit and, you know, at least watch their tongue. She never did. And the thing that I think about in this verse of Scripture is that they will consider nothing sacred. The world does not consider the pulpit sacred or pastoral, pastoral ministry sacred or even the church for that matter. Now, just because they don't does not mean that it isn't. Are you listening to me? And so we should treat it as such. But then it goes on here in this verse. It says, They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. And that's, you know, that's the thing you got to recognize, you guys. You know, as a believer, a child of God that's living for the Lord, you represent good. And the devil hates it. And so you'll, you'll see people that are used as instruments to bring that out. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, love pleasure rather than God. They'll act religious. Uh, huh? Yeah. But they will reject the power that could make them truly godly. Stay away from people like that. Can you do that? It's what he said. Stay away from them. Stay away from them. You know, uh, especially in these days, you know, you're going to find, you know, that people, they use slander. What does that mean? They say things that are untrue. Huh? I mean, we've been slandered by experts. You know, I mean, they got it down. Here just not that long ago, you know, we had a situation, you know, where somebody was telling people things that weren't true. So what do you do about that? You know? I mean, how do, you, how do you deal with that? You get right up in the middle of their stuff and say, well, I'm going to make this all right? Uh-uh. You just stay away. Huh? Let the truth, you know, fight your battles for you. Are you with me? And, of course, this person, you know, in this particular situation, they're trying to make up and say they didn't say this. And, and you know as well as I do, they're just trying to cover their backside. Aren't you glad I showed restraint there? <laughs> exactly right. They got character issues and flaws and they're jacked up and they're using, you know, they're, they're doing things and they're trying to cover themselves and so they throw it off on somebody else. Huh? Well, it's the world we live in. But you know what? Don't make no never mind about it. I'm using them as examples. I don't want you to think I'm all jazzed up about all this because we just move on. 
There are just certain things, you know, the devil will throw stuff out in front of you, and he, a lot of times it's nothing more than to see if you're going to bite. Yes. So just don't. Say, well, you know what, I don't think we need to talk about that. Huh? It's just that simple. I got immediate family members, same way, you know. Uh, it, it, they're not of the same persuasion I am. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So whenever, you know, a conversation goes uh, in a certain direction, say, well, we're not going to talk about that. Well, I want to. Sorry. <laughs> you know, that's, again, you just got to stand up into it and say, no, we're not going there. We're not going to do that. Are you with me? And if, and, well, I don't need to get into that. I'll let you decide that for yourself, you know. But I hope that this helps you. And what it is that we're talking about here, there are a lot of other things, you know, that could be said or stated, but I tell you what, you want to keep your heart pure before God. You want to have your prayers answered, don't you? Huh? You want your prayers answered? Well, you can't allow unforgiveness, you know, or some, harbor some kind of ill will or jealousy or envy or whatever, you know, because it hinders you. God, you know your heart, you guys. I know you know it. I mean, if you're born of the Holy Ghost, you got it on the inside. You know what's right and wrong. Come on. You say, well, I just don't feel like I can forgive them. Again, I'm not appealing to the way you feel. That's right. I'm appealing to your heart and what it is you know that's right. And I'm asking you to do that, not the way you feel. See, the Bible says, Jesus made the statement, Whosoever shall say to the mountain, Be thou removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe the things that he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. Therefore, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Amen. We get excited about that petition prayer business. huh? We're excited about you know having our needs met in this. But the next verse says, And... Verse 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any. Notice what it says. First, forgive anyone holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Are you listening to me? You say, well, I never thought about that. That's why we're here. <laughs> Hallelujah. God wants the best for us. Are you listening to me? Don't you want God's best? You know, there's another verse that says this. It says, you husbands, likewise you husbands. Now, if I got time, I'll get to the women. But you husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. So here we are today, and we've learned a lot, haven't we? But you're supposed to dwell with your wives according Giving honor to the wife. Well, she doesn't deserve my honor. Yes, she does. She's your wife, you knothead. You know, I don't understand. Well, no, I ain't going to, Linda. Just leave me alone. I'm just trying to temper myself here a little bit. You know, life could be a whole lot different for you men if you just learn some things from the Bible and start acting like it. Are you with me? This isn't rocket science. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Huh? For the church. You know, so likewise, you wives, you can go ahead and put it back up there again, Jim. In the same way, husbands, honor your wives. You know, don't call her your old lady. Don't call him your old man. Huh? Huh? Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. You're on the same team, for crying out loud. Huh? She may be weaker than you are, and I say that only in the context of maybe physically, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should. Now listen, so your prayers will what? Again, i got to tell off on myself. But you know, I know you guys never have a spat with your wife or a disagreement. Right? Right. I do. Okay? So if we get in a spat, I just call it that. You know, my feathers are ruffled. And her feathers are ruffled. You know, whatever. 
I caused it probably, more than likely, 95% of the time. And I got to preach. I can tell you right now, dude, we're going to get this straightened out before we do this. Because if we don't, this is going to be a disaster. Are you listening to me? So somehow or not, you know when that scripture that says, don't let, your, 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 uh, let the sun go down on your wrath? Don't let your mixed up, messed up life get in the road before you preach. Huh? So, you know, I, I mean, you know, here it is. I mean, you say what you want about it, but I might just say, well, you know, we got to get this fixed. Before I go up there, she says, well, you're right. And she just let it hang. (laughs) And then I got to say, you know what, I'm sorry. And the reality is, is whatever the fuss was, it wasn't worth anything anyway. You know what I'm saying? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you guys, a lot of this stuff that we fuss about doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Are you with me? Amen. Now that's only happened once in our entire ministry life. So just in case you're wondering, you know. But I guess my point to that is, is that it, the application is uh, the same for all of us in your lives. You want your prayers to be hindered? Then try to, you know, make sure you have it your way. And not forgive. And harbor. And talk ugly. And all that. You know, the the quality of your life can be whatever you want it to be, you guys. And I'm telling you, he offers us an abundant life. So let's just learn, praise God, to follow him. Obey the Holy Ghost. Amen? And make the right kinds of choices when we're choosing our friendships. Huh? You know? And when we're choosing, you know, uh, who it is that we hang out with. When we're choosing our spouse. You better make sure you make the right decision. Well, I'll change him when we get married. No, you won't. No, most of the time what happens is the real person comes out then. How many of you know what I'm talking about that? Have you been married? Oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? You better know and have the same kind of qualities, the same kinds of goals, the same kinds of pursuits, somebody that loves God. Are you listening? You know, the Bible says that we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, man. Don't go out and marry some unbelieving outfit. Yeah, but I love her. No, you, well, you might. I mean, I don't know, but I'm just telling you, it ain't going to be good because you're going to be heading in different directions. Well, you know, there are so few of them out there. That may be true, but God has one for you. Absolutely. Amen. My daughter went through that whole thing and And then all of a sudden, here comes Glenn, and now she's got her Boaz. Hallelujah. You know? You ever consider yourself to be Boaz? No, probably not. Well, anyway, amen. And I mean, she had some some really close relationships with uh, uh, some individuals and things like that and broke it off because she knew. Gals, don't settle for less than what God has for you. Are you listening to me? Don't do it. And I know, I mean, no, I don't really know. Uh, you know, I, I guess a better way to say that is I can't appreciate the loneliness and, and, you know, things of that nature that are associated with being, being single. But, dude, wait. And wait on the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart, and it'll be like nothing you could ever imagine. Are you with me? And you'll be glad. You really will be. Praise God. Amen. Well, i got to quit. It's already 11.15. Who uh, messed with the clock? Huh? Probably nobody. Why don't you stand together? You've been sitting for quite a while. Let's stand together. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, the love way is the winner's way, right? How many of you want to win? Praise God. It's God's way and it's our way. And we're just going to make the determination to be lovers and not haters. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. And again, Father, as we come before you, we just thank you for the instruction of your word. I pray, Father, that the things we've shared here today are helpful, that they help us, Father God, to navigate through, um, well, sometimes treacherous, perilous water. And God, I just thank you for every believer here within the sound of my voice, that, Father, 
as children of God, they're well able and they're capable, Father, of being able to do everything that you've called them to do. And Father, I pray for marriages. I pray for those that may be watching um, by internet. Pray for them, Father, in the marriage relationships. And Father God, that they learn to love one another as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I pray, Father, that in families, whether they be immediate or extended, that Father, the love of God that's been shed abroad in our heart would be the dominant force within each and every one of our lives, that our lives and our voice and our behavior, Father, would be that that is born of you, that our words would be choice and that they would be filled with grace and that there wouldn't be any evil, corrupt communication that come out, that we don't have to defend ourselves Oh, Father, help us. Help us, help us, help us. While your heads are bowed, please, eyes are closed, no one's looking around. You know, maybe this is a time, an opportunity for some decisions to be made in your own heart uh, about how you're going to move forward. And I know, you know, sometimes we get patterns in our lives and behaviors, you know, that get deep-seated and embedded in us. But thank God that doesn't have to stay that way if they're the wrong kinds of behaviors. So maybe today could be that day where you just say, Lord, I need your help. I want to be the person you want me to be. I want to walk in the light as you'd have me to. And I ask you to help me from this day forward. I want you just to pray this prayer as a congregation with me, if you would. Say this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you've done to make me everything I am. I thank you for your love that dwells in me. Help me, Father, to let that love dominate my life. And I thank you, Lord, for showing me what I can do, what I should do, and what I will do. And I thank you, Lord, for your blessing in Jesus' name. Now, while your heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking around, if you happen to be here this morning and you never made a decision to receive Christ or made a conscious decision to become a follower of Him, you never asked Him to forgive you of all your sins and come into your heart and be the Lord of your life, while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if there's anyone here this morning and you find yourself in that place, but you would say, Pastor, I have an interest in your prayers. I want to know Jesus. Can I see your hand anywhere as I look across the crowd here today? Anyone? You're not born again, not saved, and yet you'd want to be. Anyone at all? Those of you that are watching by internet, you may have never made the decision before, but you can pray a simple prayer and say, God, please forgive me. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. I want you to be my Savior. It's a simple prayer, but it's powerful. And so, Father, we just thank you today for your grace in every one of our lives. Father, to live in love and to follow after those things you'd have us to. And we're so grateful, Father God, for our heritage. We thank you for our inheritance. And God, we look forward to the soon return of Jesus. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. We're going to go ahead and receive our morning offering. The other